Everyone, greetings. I am the Reverend Jill Olds, the director of the Youth Ministry Institute here at Yale Divinity School. The YMI is very pleased to welcome all of you to today's webinar entitled Faith at Home, Empowering Parents with the Reverend Tracy Smith. I see some familiar faces and names among our group today. So welcome back to those of you who have joined us before and a special welcome to all of you who are joining our YMI community for the first time. We are very glad that you were able to be with us today. For our time today, Reverend Smith will speak to us and there will be a breakout session. We'll conclude with a final Q&A time. We're asking that you remain muted throughout our session with the exception of the breakout room time, but we'll be monitoring the chat window. So if you have a question, please do type it in there at any time and we will happily get that into our program. Our office has a fantastic staff. I'd like to introduce them quickly and thank them for their work. The Youth Ministry Institute falls under the purview of the Center for Continuing Ed at YDS. So we have Kelly Morrissey, the Managing Director of the Center for Continuing Education. And we're blessed to have Megan Lukens, our Communications Coordinator. Thanks to both of you for your presence and for all of your hard work. If you are new to the Yale Youth Ministry Institute, we invite you to peruse our website when you get a free moment. That's YaleYouthMinistryInstitute.org. We have a whole array of resources on there. We have curricula for your youth, training modules for youth leaders. We have discussion forums. We have over a thousand video clips and lectures given by the world's leading youth ministry experts. We have COVID-19 era resources. We have tips for resilience with youth, resources for anti-racism work with youth, links to other articles and materials. We have so much on that website and all of that is available to you for free. So please do feel free to go check that out. The video from today's webinar will be emailed to all of you sometime in the next week. So if you miss something and would like to cycle back, you will have that capability. And in that email, you'll also be getting a special treat which is a link to four short videos that Tracy has created for us, showcasing how to practically implement some of her spiritual practices. They're pretty fantastic. So don't scroll past that email when it shows up in your inbox. This is our final offering for the official school year for YDS, but we're also delighted to invite you to mark your calendars for June 7th through 11th, which is the week for Yale Divinity School's summer study. During that week, the Reverend Dr. Almeida Wright, professor at YDS, will be teaching a course for us entitled Developing a Faithful Generation on Faith Development with Youth. That course will take place on Monday through Friday of that week from 1.30 to 4 p.m. every day. And a link will be posted in the chat here. Please do check out our website for more information on that event as well. We're also putting the final touches on our 2021 to 2022 calendar, specifically for these uh, monthly gatherings. And just so you all are aware, our tentative plan is to continue to be remote through the fall, but to offer our large in-person gatherings once again in 2022. For those not joining us from the New Haven, Connecticut area, you will still be able to join us via live stream. And of course, the broken record for COVID is that, complete the sentence for me, this is all subject to change. So if you haven't signed up for our monthly YMI monthly newsletters, please do so on our website to receive the most up-to-date information for all of our offerings. And now without further ado, it is my deep pleasure to introduce all of you to Reverend Smith. The Reverend Tracy Hi. Smith, is a PCUSA minister, a graduate of Princeton Theological Seminary. Tracy served as a local church pastor in the San Antonio era, area before moving up to Elmhurst, Illinois to become the minister at Elmhurst Presbyterian Church in 2018. Reverend Smith is the author of the Faithful Families book series, including Faithful Families, Prayers for Faithful Families, Faithful Families for Advent and Christmas, and most recently, Faithful Families for Lent and Easter and the resurrection. She is also a frequent blogger and article writer, a wife and mother of three children. Much of Tracy's work can be found on her website, tracy-smith.com, where she focuses on children's ministries and her thoughtful, playful, approachable style is the perfect answer to those who are specifically wondering about how to experience spirituality as a family. 
long before the COVID era Zoom culture shift, Tracy has honed how to bring faith into the home and how to do that very well. Tracy, thank you so much for being here. We are beyond honored to have you and I'll let you take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jill, uh, for the invitation. Thank you to uh, Yale Divinity School Center for Continuing Education for the invitation. And most of all, thank you to all of you who have taken a moment out of your day, uh, 90 moments, <laughs> to be here together uh, for this, this time. So I'll, I'll jump right in. We have a big agenda. I'm very glad to know that you'll have access to the recording. I think, you know, whenever I go to a continuing education event like this, I want to just be a good student and get everything that I can out of it. But I would encourage you to take a more relaxed approach. Just let the spirit be present, take notes if you want, but know that you can come back if there's something you want to dive in a little bit deeper with. So just a little housekeeping from my end, Jill mentioned that you are free to put in questions in the Q&A. If you have any clarification questions that are live, feel free to type those in the chat. I can't guarantee that I'll be able to grab it, um, but if I can, I'd be more than happy to try and clarify on the spot. If I can't, there's time for breakout rooms where you'll be able to maybe chat with some of your peers. And then also I'm uh, available and accessible after through uh, the Q&A and then even beyond through Jill, if there's any clarification questions. I'm also going to be uh, going back and forth between the slides and uh, my face. I love the, the uh, virtual reality that we're in because you can don't have to get on a plane and travel, but I do feel like we lose a little bit of what I would like to do if we were in the same room together. So I hope that you'll forgive the little bit of, uh, you know, toggling between the screens and my face because uh, we want to get a, a smooth presentation. So in, a, in, that, in that vein, I'm going to go ahead and share uh, my screen for you. All right. All right, so here we are. Let me know if you have trouble seeing anything. But as Jill said, now here I am, and my you've already seen me, but um, as Jill said, I am a mom, I am a parent, I am a pastor, and I'm an author. And for me, the my happy, happy, happy place is when all of those things come together in a, you know, a sort of Venn diagram all together. That's my calling and it's my calling for everything. So some people like to have a very strict separation between their work and their home. Uh, I actually feel like all of those things come together in many ways. I feel like my kids are focus groups <laughs> and they're also uh, part of the family business, right? They, uh, they help out in so many ways. So that is a little brief introduction to me. And uh, I hope that we get to know each other a little bit as we go along too. So I wanted to get some quick info about you guys. Uh, I wish that we could all have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, but uh, there's just three questions that I had for all of those attending. The first one is just, I would love to get a sense of what your role is in your uh, job. Are you ordained? paid volunteer, denominational staff, or other. Sorry to the others, because I really wanted to get a good sense of who is who, but I know there are some people that defy that categorization. Uh, we'll probably give this uh, until we have at least 95%, if we can, of people voting. All right, so that looks great. As we're kind of assuming or suspecting, it looks like if you, most of us do this for our job, whether we get paid or not, <laughs> we are doing this for our job. All right, so maybe give you five more seconds and then we can go on to the next. All right, so paid church staff, you win. <laughs> 
hopefully half of you are in that role. And then we have ordained clergy, denominational staff volunteers, and then others to the 11 others of you. Uh, yay for you. <laughs> the next, next question. All right, this is one that is, uh, I feel like kind of, I wanna ask right now. So, if you had to pick, I know some of you are looking at this question going, I don't know, can I pick all of them? Can I pick all of these? I forgot I did let you do that. Ah. <laughs> I gave you an out. Shouldn't have. All right, I think we can go ahead and close this one out in five, two, there we go. <laughs> That's all right, we can close it now, it's good. Attendance. All right, so how burned out are you feeling as you sit here? we can go ahead and end this one too. I'd like to, before we go to the next poll, um, just say to the five of you, the 2% that are so crispy that you're feeling fried, I would like to give you total permission to turn off the webinar, <laughs> take a nap and watch the recording later. Um, and to those of you that are in that pretty burned out stage, I hear you and I hope that you will also take this, uh, the next 90 minutes very lightly not feel like you have to um, use this as a time to really push on the gas. We could do a whole other webinar just on that topic, but I was just curious how everybody's doing as you sit here. And then I think we have one final, final question just for fun. You know, it's always fun to have an insider question. So this is my insider question. Let's see where we are here. This also can maybe give me a guess about your denominational affiliation. <laughs> I didn't want to get too into the weeds with that. So those of you that are, well, I'll, I won't say until the end. I won't give it away. Great, I think we can go ahead and close this one down. So this, for those of you that were wondering, what is this question? It's how you say uh, that one line in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our what as we forgive our who. So lots of uh, trespasses and those who trespass against us. Um, I just thought it would be a fun, little funny way. So uh, thank you for sharing 
a little bit about yourself with me. It's helpful for me to know a little bit about who's in the room and who's on the call. And you, like uh, we've been saying, if you've just joined us, there will be a time for breakouts uh, towards the end. I think we can just go ahead and let the whole polls go away for now, if that's okay, Megan. Thank you so much to Megan for being our pollster and helping us out. Um, Another, let's see if I can get to my screen here. Hmm. There we go. So this quote, faith is learned when it is woven seamlessly into the fabric of daily life. This is kind of my, um, what do I want to call it? Signature quote. This is the heart uh, around which all of my books are built. It's kind of become, you know, as careers go and as the spirit unfolds our life, it's become sort of a career path for me. I really uh, learned this in seminary. Shout out to Kenda Dean, who was a professor of mine at Princeton Theological Seminary, who didn't say it in exactly this way, but really uh, formed me to, to know and believe that faith is learned through practice. This is something that I wanted to impart into my own children. And it's something that I have a real passion for helping those who lead children, youth, and families into doing. So that is the heart of how I approach everything. And that's the heart of this talk today. I, as Jill said, have written a number of books around this and these are how they unfold in chronological order. I, you know, whenever I do a talk like this, I wanna balance uh, giving you the information that's in there but not repeating what's in, <laughs> in there. So I will reference these books and talk about them. I think of them as cookbooks for a lot of reasons and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit um, further. But if you want to do a deep dive, if you want all the recipes, this is where you find them. So today's agenda, you know, I'm Presbyterian and we love a good agenda. So you don't need to write this down. This is just so that you have a roadmap of where we're going. And we are actually right on track with where I wanted to be time-wise. So yay! We're going to understand how I view faith at home through tradition, ritual, and spiritual practice. And we're going to discuss your role as leaders as we just discussed most of us do this as a, whether we're paid or volunteer. I want to discuss your role in faith at home as the leader and to give you three examples of how you could understand your role. And we'll meet each other and respond to the material. We won't have nearly enough time to do that. It will just be a little sort of taste of that. If we were doing a day long event or something, we'd have much more time. But I think it's so nice just to see the face of somebody else doing the same work, even if you've never seen them or met them before or will again. Then we may talk about barriers parents often face uh, in doing faith at home. I will give you a warning. We, it's likely we won't get there uh, because we will want to be doing the Q&A. But I always uh, have more than we can cover in the time, just depending. Who knows? I've had a bit of coffee, so maybe I'm talking super fast today. <laughs> if we get there, we do. If we don't, we don't. So three pillars of faith at home. I'm just going to show them to you, and then I'm going to take my screen off and just talk with you about them. So these pillars are tradition, ritual, and spiritual practice. I'm going to turn off my screen for a bit and just talk with you about tradition, ritual, and spiritual practice. So like I said, when I wrote my first cookbook, my first book of faith practices at home, I organized it around traditions, rituals, and spiritual practices. Actually, the, the first book uses the term ceremony in place of ritual. That was the publisher's choice. So tradition, ritual, and spiritual practice. Now, when I talk about this, I kind of just put them all in the bucket of spiritual practice. I think there's a usefulness in pulling them out, especially when we're having a conversation like this. But for parents, if you're gonna try and teach this to your parents, I don't know if you need to separate them out. You could also easily just talk to your parents about faith practices in the home. But for our purposes today, I'm going to talk about them in that way of tradition, ritual, and spiritual practice. What all the practices that I like to teach have in common is that they're easy to do. Uh, they're repeated, whether you repeat it once a year or 
you know, once a day, uh, that they become habits and that they're customized to the family and that they're simple. That's my uh, kind of bread and butter. I believe that those things make for effective faith practice at home. And that's the, those are the recipes that I like to make. So traditions, I think of a tradition a simple definition, a faith tradition as, as you would a regular tradition. It's something that happens on a regular basis. And a faith tradition could be something like a birthday blessing. It could be like having a Christmas tree blessing, an Advent candle wreath at home, uh, or um, a nighttime blessing when you put your children to bed. Now, I'm buzzing through all of these practices, and I want to remind you that at the end of this, in a week or so, you'll be getting videos that show you practices, examples of these. So we don't need to get into the weeds of all of what they would be, um, but the videos do take you there. I'll use the example of Advent candles because a lot of us do this in our homes, you know, or our churches rather, having a four candles, one in the middle, and lighting one for the weeks of Advent, and then the Christ candle on Christmas Eve. That could be a faith tradition at home that you could empower your families to do. When it comes to rituals, rituals I think of as something that marks the moment, right? A ritual is a moment marking time. So maybe you have a ritual that happens when your baby takes his or her first steps, you have a special prayer, special blessing. Maybe it's a ritual when the child is leaving for college. Maybe it is a ritual for when you're burying a pet after the pet dies. So ritual is a time to mark the moment. A faith at home ritual is marking the moment at home. And I'll talk about your role and how to do this with your parents and families in just a little bit. And then finally, spiritual practice. Examples of spiritual practice uh, could be prayer. That's the big one. I've fished that one out as a whole separate book, but something like the labyrinth or fasting or almsgiving. These are spiritual practices, some of them ancient, thousands of years of church history supporting these spiritual practices. How do we break those down in easy ways for families at home? So it's kind of an overview of all of the recipes that you could have. I wanna talk about this recipe concept for just a second to kind of drill in the point that I wanna to make to you all so that you can make it to your parents when you're teaching them about this. So when I, I love to cook, probably obvious. <laughs> when I get a cookbook, I do read the whole thing because I wanna read about every possible thing I could make. But in even in my favorite cookbooks, I am only going to choose probably 10% of them to cook for my family. And then there will maybe be a small percentage of those that I really like and that my family really likes. And then there'll be an even smaller percentage of those that become family favorites, right? So what we're trying to aim for, I think, are the family favorites at home. And part of the challenge is everybody likes different stuff. Everybody's family is a little bit different. But the idea of what you're trying to do and what I'm trying to do is not to throw everything at the families so that they're overwhelmed with recipes and ideas. And we'll get into the weeds of that a little bit more in the future. So if we take, if we step back from all of this and think about how to help families choose the faith practices that are going to work for them, how do we do that? One thing that I would encourage you do, if you did some, maybe a training with parents or if you were just talking one-on-one -on -one with a, a small group about faith at home, if I'm doing a, a presentation like this for parents, what I would say to them is, first question, what, when you think of your children leaving you on that day when they leave you, whether that's in two years or four years or 18 years, when you think of them leaving, maybe 26 years, 30 years, they're living in the basement, what do you want them to know about your faith? Not intellectually, but in their heart. 
what three things would you want them to internalize about faith at home? And I try to get parents to write down three, five would be my max, but even if you can get them to do one, that would be great. I'm not going to share mine. I have personal ones that I feel like are actually different maybe than the ones that I have as a pastor, but I'll share one of mine. So one of mine that I want my children when they leave me, I want them always to know that God is loving and gracious and God loves them and accepts them no matter what. That's one of my key ones, probably for me, the most important one. And then there's a number of others. But then to ask ourselves and to ask our families and parents, what are three things, three to five things that you do not want your children to believe about God when they leave you? And one of mine, I'm going to put up one of my uh, more maybe controversial ones that some of our theological nerds might uh, debate with me about, but it's my own. So I'm going to tell it to you. So one of mine would be, I do not want my children to believe that God demands a blood sacrifice for sins. That's not how I view uh, the work of Jesus on the cross. And so I want to make sure that my parents do not have that view of God. It's a pretty theologically specific one because I'm a pastor. So if I was using this as an example with parents, I would maybe say, I don't want my children to grow up believing that God chooses some people over others based on their skin color or their uh, socioeconomic state status that all, all people are created equal. So once you do that, you have your list of values that you want the children to have when they leave you and values that you hope they don't absorb, then you can kind of back into it, right? You back into it through these faith practices. If I want my children to ultimately leave me with a view that God is loving and gracious and just and kind, uh, it's probably not something that I would say one time and hope that they remember it. It's probably something I would want to incorporate into the rhythm of our family life as much as possible through faith practice. So that's a little kind of um, backing up exercise. If you do this with a mixed group of parents of all ages, one of the things that will come up is a worry from parents of older kids that they're too late. They'll say, I didn't, do, I didn't do this exercise when my children are babies, and now it's too late. And I just want to offer that pastoral reminder that it's not too late, number one. <laughs> and number two, you probably do this instinctively already, even without having this book or this workshop or this thing, right? So um, to help parents that are on the older end of the spectrum with some of the grief uh, that comes if you do an exercise like this and to just um, hold that space for them. So I don't get into uh, the research as much as others, but I do pay attention to research related to this stuff. One of the things that I think is really important to impress upon families and for you to know is the research about uh, and around habits and routines. And this is also intuitive. And we've done this as a church. And there's a reason why we say the Lord's Prayer every single Sunday, right? And those of us that are ordained clergy that have the joy of visiting um, people in their 80s and 90s uh, that have lived long lives, even when other parts of our brain have not working, are not working in the ways that we used to have them work, if we pop in the Lord's Prayer, sometimes it's right there, right? And it's because of this. It's because things are repeated over time gradually. They become the different neural pathways are formed. Um, those neural pathways, when it comes to prayer and meditation, have a whole host of of benefits that the, the uh, will serve children and adults well in terms of being able to self-regulate, be calm, all of these things. But it doesn't come from a big dump uh, of, of, you know, once in a while. It comes from small repeated over time things. I love, there's a quote from Bono from YouTube and somebody asked him one time, like, how do you do everything that you do? And he said, I store up sleep in my hump, right? Like, in other words, I don't sleep 
and then I sleep for a long time. And it doesn't work that way. That's not how it works with sleep. And that's not how it works with faith practice. So a big soapbox of mine is the reminder that these faith practices don't have to be fancy. They don't have to be uh, a lot of time, but if you can repeat them, that will be your greatest secret sauce. If you can do 30 seconds a day of something for a year, you'll make a greater impact on your child's faith development than you would taking them to vacation Bible school, right? For example, and as an example. Um, so that's something to pass on to your families. Customizable, you know, that's something that's hard for you as faith leaders to get them to be customized for each family, but depending on your church size, I would encourage you to try to do that, to really listen to your families, get in there about their lives, and to know enough about different options to be able to say, you know what, it sounds like for your family, you might want to try X, Y, or Z. Also, when I talk to families about doing this, I try to talk about the importance of um, failure and the importance of letting go of things that don't work. So again, sorry for the recipe analogy again, but it works really well. <laughs> you know, if you have something that you're not sure if you like it or not, sometimes you make it again. So helping parents to balance that, right? We're going to go full steam ahead. We're going to do this prayer every night for a year when everybody's like, I don't like it. It doesn't taste good. It's terrible, right? That's not the right way. But maybe we want to try something more than just once before we decide whether or not it works for our family. Um, I think that another thing that I want you to give to your families if you're talking about this is the grace and the pastoral presence of knowing how overloaded they are, especially right now, right? Um, parents have been asked to do everything during the pandemic. They've been asked to cut their kids' hair and be their kids' social workers and therapists and all of these things. So there's, even before the pandemic, when I talk to parents, there's a Newsweek cover. If you Google the myth of the perfect mother Newsweek, you would get a picture of a mom with like all these different arms, like she's holding the soccer ball, she's holding the book, she's holding all of these different things. And I want us as faith leaders to be careful not to give parents an additional arm now. Now she has to have the faith arm or the dad has to have the faith arm. Uh, and to try and say these faith practices that we're doing at home, we're doing them together as a family. It's not me teaching you, it's all of us together on this journey, learning and exploring together. I did see a question pop up about grandparents. I didn't see all of the details about it, but I think if you have grandparents in your congregation, you could easily teach, pick some of the practices that you think would work well for grandparents and talk to them about this. Grandparents have a huge impact on our faith development. We know that as, as clergy and uh, youth leaders, how many grandparents now uh, number one, have the caregiving role uh, with our grandchildren, and then also have been the people historically who pass on the faith, right? So we can't really get into the weeds of some of those tricky dynamics if you have a parent that's not interested in that and a grandparent who really is. You know, that's a whole different topic, but yes to grandparents learning these things and teaching them. Okay, so if there are questions about this section, drop them in the chat. I'm not going to take them now, but Jill will <laughs> take a look at them, see if there are any. Oh, I know this question, Sarah. Um, reach out to me on email. I'll, I do I do workshops sometimes for clergy who want to do this with their children because you feel like you are, are the uh, cobbler and your kids have no shoes. I do want to address this one because I saw it and it's very dear to my heart because of my position. Um, I would encourage you to pick one faith practice out of the videos that you're going to get or out of my books or something that you've heard me say and give yourself permission to, for 30 seconds a day, do it with your family. Um, I have a, I don't know how old your kids are, Sarah, but I have a four-year-old and ours is, uh, I stretch up high, I bend down low, 
I hug the ones I love. Good morning, if it's the morning. Good morning, Marina, that's her name. Good morning, world. Good morning, God. That's a prayer in my prayer book. And we say that prayer every morning in the morning and every night at night. And right now, that's her faith formation at home. <laughs> that's it. Um, so it can be very, very easy. So we're going to move on to your role as the ministry leader. And so you're uh, going to be done looking at my face for a while. You could look at these pictures and meditate on these. I have three roles for you. And you're going to be like, what? But I think it's kind of fun. Come on, little engine. You can move. I don't know if it's going to catch up in advance now, like four or five more slides, but... one. That is the first one. So the first is a curator. Okay. So I want you to think of yourself as an art curator in this, in this area of life when it comes to faith at home with families. So what does a good art curator do? A good curator is very selective. Okay. So I send out an email resource every Tuesday to faith leaders and Christian educators, and it's called Treasure Box Tuesday, and it's my five links for the week. And they're usually faith and family related, but sometimes they're not. They're just things that I think people in your position would like. And I get lots of requests for people that want things to go in there and lots of ideas but I feel like it's my job to only pass on things that meet my criteria, whatever that is. And you should do that too for your parents and your families. There is a lot of stuff on the internet. There are a lot of books. There are a lot of resources. There are a lot of publishers, a lot of perspectives. So I think it is your job as pastor, as youth leader, as Christian minister, to have high standards and to bounce the things out <laughs> that you don't think fit what your people need. And so for me, you know, my criteria, I want things to have gender inclusive language. I want them to be anti-racist. I want them to be simple. I want them to have um, a theology that I don't think is toxic and damaging to children. And believe me, there are a lot of resources out there that do have things in there that I would not have children wanting to absorb. So bouncing the things that do not meet the criteria that you want for them, I think is very important. And to teach this to your parents, right? More is not better. All the books is not the best. All the children's Bibles is not better than one really good one. So you are a curator for your parents so that when you have something for them and you say, this is something that you can take home to help form your children in the faith, it's the best of the best. Now that said, I don't, we don't want to make parents paranoid that they can't use their own intuition to find these things. But if you're going to give it out, make sure that it's something that you really have previewed and you really stand. Curators create exhibits, right? They don't just throw all the Monet at you. They might be doing uh, an exhibit about flowers in the springtime. So you might decide, I wanna focus in with my families for 10 weeks on prayer. <laughs> wow, that seems like a long time, but that's an, that's an exhibit that you're creating and it's focused and it's clear and it's, something that parents could wrap their heads around, even if they weren't there every week, because that's one of your problems is getting them there every week. Cur good curators make art accessible, right? So they take something that an art history major might know a lot about, and they make it so easy. They have a little thing that says, this is what the artist was thinking about. This is what they're trying to do. And the Many people think the purple blob means this. <laughs> so that's your job is to take all the information and distill it down to something that your parents can really understand. Okay, coach. Oh, you know what? I lied, curator. I, for each of these, I have uh, an opposite profession that I think sometimes 
people in our uh, role fall into. So you're a curator, not an entertainer, <laughs> right? A lot of times we think like, it's our job to get up and put on the clown costume and like make people uh, entertain them and help them to have a good time. Uh, there's a space for that, but I think that's maybe something that we don't want to do. Another thing with the curator, and this is like, I say this in love because it takes one to know one, but if I were to ask all of us on this call to take a picture of our offices <laughs> and post it, I know, like, see, what, what do I have in here? Um, inflatable hockey sticks, a slide, some puzzles. Like, I know you guys have piles of pipe cleaners in there, all kinds of stuff. Like it is good. It is right and good and pleasing to God to curate one's office from time to time. Just that's a little extra bonus tip. Okay. So curator over entertainer. Next coach. What do good coaches do? Not the bad ones, right? Not those bad coaches. Good coaches. They motivate. You can do this. I know you've got this. You have everything that you need. Go parents, go. Uh, I think this is so important for parents. Parents need somebody that's going to show them what they could have if they do this. What does it, what does it mean for their kids? It means so many good things for them if they stick with this and stay the course. Good coaches create a team. So one thing that you could do is to help your parents know that they don't do this alone, right? So if what we're going to talk about as a congregation is uh, acts of service, we could throw that out for our families. We're focusing on acts of service. And here's some ways you could do acts of service at home. Again, referencing the videos you're going to get. That's one of the three minute chunks is some uh, acts of service practices, you could pick one and say, you know what, as a church, we're all going to do one of these acts of service practices. Uh, and we will come together and share our experiences, talk about how it went. Uh, everybody send in your picture of your money jar that you have at your table. Tell us where you're putting the money that you're raising. It's a team environment. I recently did a uh, panel discussion with a number of people through the Atlantic School of Theology. I don't know if it's available as a recording, but one of the panelists was Stephen Argue, who is on the uh, Fuller, does the Fuller Youth Ministry stuff. And he said something that really stuck with me, and I think it is true, that when we have children on the younger end of the spectrum, babies in particular, there is this culture with parents around wow, you know, parents, baby parents, like, let's get together and talk about this. Like, how do you feed your kid? And like, how do you, what's the bedtime schedule? What do you even do? How, I don't even know anything. And faith formation leaders help with that. And we have parents of young children groups and so forth. And then he was arguing and offering that as the older children get the less of those resources there are, and parents begin to sort of self-isolate and they don't get together and say, my teen is having X, Y, and Z behavior or issue or question. And they don't realize that everybody else has that same exact issue. Maybe not, kids are all different, right? But there are common threads and that we can adopt that beginner's attitude with our teen and tween parents. So that's just a little um, gift from, thank you to Stephen for, saying that in that way. I think that's an important thing. And then good coaches teach the fundamentals. You know, we don't, we can't have faith just sort of absorbed through osmosis. <laughs> like they'll just hang out in the church and they'll get it. That's, that's maybe how we teach the basics of some of the facts or theology of our faith. But when it comes to faith practice, how do you learn how to pray? How do you learn how to listen to God's voice? How do you learn to give alms? We learn by doing it and having little 
practices. So that is your role as a coach is to teach the fundamentals. I deliberately did not put teacher on here because I think that we have a, a too much of a Sunday school model. And I could go on that tangent some other day, but I'd like you to think of it as, as a coach or over and above a teacher. The one that I put as the opposite hand that I think we often fall into the trap of doing that I'd like you to get off of your uh, label is that of cruise director. <laughs> you don't have to be a cruise director. You don't have to plan the activities, bring in a band, all of these things. There again is a time and a place for that. But if you feel like a cruise director, I would encourage you to wonder if uh, why you think you need to do that and uh, if there's a way to gently change. No shame in that. I've been a cruise director and I still am in a lot of the time. Okay, how are we doing on time? Pretty good. We're good. Hanging in there. Okay. Final is food blogger. I, full disclosure, had a food blog. It taught me how to use the internet. It was so much fun. I loved it. And so I learned a lot about a lot being a food blogger. So that's one of the reasons that this is uh, an example to me. So if you don't know what a food blogger is based, and they're, they're still kind of popular. They had their big heyday, but they're still kind of popular. So basically what they would do is cook a recipe and then post the recipe and post pictures of it and talk about how they found the recipe tips and things about it. So I think this is a great example of what you are called to do in this position when it comes to teaching faith at home. So good food bloggers, um, they experiment with new recipes. That's part of the job. They want to try these things out for themselves. So if you, you know, if you feel like the cobbler's kids have no shoes, you trying faith practices at home with your own kids is part of your job. It's work, that's work time. You're trying it out so that you can help others to do it at home. You can experiment with these. If you uh, don't have kids in your house or teens in your house, you wanna do something with teens, you gotta borrow some. So see if you can um, you know, borrow some, have a focus group so that you can try these things out, right? You don't wanna teach something that you've never, tried or you don't know how it's going to work, you want to experiment and see which ones you like um, that you'd like to teach. Add your own touches, right? I think some people when they're doing a recipe, they need that exact first A, then B, then C. This is how you do it. But you all are from different denominations. You have different faith traditions. You have different intuitions, different theologies. Those questions about what you're trying to get to in the end are different. So you have different sprinkles of things. You might want to throw in a lot of extra cinnamon into yours. You know, you are going to, if you want to do this well and in an authentic way, you can't just take somebody's ideas and throw them out. You want to adapt them for your congregations. And I want that as a caution for all the curriculum that you're previewing and using. A lot of people want to push a specific product maybe, um, but you have, you know your people better than anybody else. Nobody knows them as well as you do. And so follow your instinct and your heart and get rid of things in big quantities that don't fit. Balance old and new. Food, food bloggers will uh, try the latest thing, you know, the right, latest recipe, but they'll also just really teach you how to make a good uh, basic bread. So I encourage you to balance the old with the new. You know, faith practice, we have so much to learn from the early church about how they did this in community. It's not, it uh, doesn't have to be new and fancy. <laughs> Can be, and I, I love the new and fancy, but I think that you um, will balance that. And so the food blogger is as opposed to, blanking on what I said, a chef. <laughs> so you're not there to make the finest meal and prepare it for your people so that they eat it. You're just showing it and displaying it for them. All right, let me just do a quick run through, make sure I got everything I wanted with this. Okay, I think we're good. So we are um, 
right on schedule for the next piece. Oh, wait, sorry, I lied, I lied. We're gonna get to the breakout room. So get ready, if you are uh, sort of halfway listening, <laughs> it's time to shoo the people out of your office because we're about to go into breakout rooms and I'd love for everybody to be in a breakout room. So breakout rooms are coming. Okay, uh, simplicity is a huge soapbox of mine. I feel like I've probably already touched on this a little bit or you've noticed it or you can feel it through what I've said, but I want to be very explicit on simplicity uh, for a second. So simplicity, there is a, a quote about designers that designers know that they have reached their perfect design, not when there is more to add, but they when they know that there is nothing more they can take away. So I want you to think about faith at home practice and bringing this to your families in this way not what do what more do i need to add but what do i what can i take away can i is there more that i can take away is there more that i can take away is this as simple as it can be is there any extraneous worksheets or pipe cleaners or glue or whatever how can i make this more simple one example i like to give for this is from my child's therapy. I have two children who require occupational and speech therapy. And when we went into COVID, the therapies all went online. And this, my son's occupational therapist would send me an email and she would send it like an hour before the class. And it would be like, hi, Mrs. Smith, we get so excited about therapy. If you could just get a few things ready, you'll need salad tongs, Play-Doh to, you know, whatever, a chair, a blanket, a yoga mat, you know, and it was just so hard and overwhelming. And then I would have to be doing all this and it was necessary, right? For, for physical therapy and occupational therapy. He did need all of these tools and we did, she did get better about doing it in advance. She was just overloaded like the rest of us. But to think about that perspective when you're giving things out, right? Do does a parent have to find a pair of scissors and a, this to, in order to do the practice or can they do it just with what they have? And if I'm gonna send materials home, do I need to send all of these or maybe just one, right? So I think that's um, your challenge for so many things. The other one about simplicity is repetition. I've said this a lot, but I think sometimes we feel this pressure in our position to come up with something novel every week. And number one, you're probably, unless you're really bucking trends, not having the same families there every week. So if you're doing something different, people are missing it. And then for two, if you did the same thing every week for two or even four or even six weeks, you would be doing that repetition that is so valuable and important. So in just a second, I'm going to show you uh, a body prayer. It's the Lord's Prayer body prayer, and it's to get you moving before our breakouts. And then also to, to show this as an example. And I have done the Lord's Prayer body prayer as a children's moment for six weeks before. And that's just the contents of the children's message. And nobody gets tired of it. Nobody thinks like, well, what? She's not doing her job. Why is she just doing the same thing every week for six weeks? It's, uh, people love it. And by the end of it, children have, and parents and grandparents have learned this way. And then, you know, to this day, when we say the Lord's Prayer, some of the children do the thing because they had all of that repetition and all of that time to learn it. And it wasn't just um, entertainer, cruise director, fancy trying to show something new every week. So I'm going to go ahead and do this uh, for you. If it doesn't go well, I'm going to stop it and find it on YouTube and do it in a different way, but it's hopefully it will go just fine. All right, and then I would like to give a shout out to the three. These are my beautiful kids, Clayton, Samuel, and Marina. And now, Megan, I might need your help because my the little keyboard is like not letting me do this full stream. But let's see how it goes. All right, so get up off of your chair if you can and do this body prayer with my kids. They can do it, you can do it.
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. So that is uh, on my YouTube channel. So if you did a Google search of you, uh, Tracy Smith, Body Prayer, Lord's Prayer, you can find it again. I'm going to stop um, my screen sharing here for a second just to show you some things. Let me share. Jesus, take the wheel. Megan, can you stop my sharing or do I need to do that? The only option I have, it says new share. And I, I want to stop sharing. It only says stop video. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Sorry, I do this all the time. I'm just nervous, I guess. Okay, so one thing about the Lord's Prayer, body prayer, just to illustrate a few points, is the reason I wanted to record my own and put it out for you is that a lot of them have um, in the forgive us our debts or sins or trespasses, however you do it, however you identified yourself this morning as doing it, a lot of them had something like forgive us our debts, like it had like a naughty, a naughty symbol, and I don't like that. Uh, so I just sort of changed it. Again, you do your own thing. You make it work for your theology and your community. I wanted it to be forgive us our debts in this way, like kind of a a washing type motion. So we're going to hop into breakouts. I'm glad that we have the kind of time that I wanted. I think we're going to do 12, uh, 12 minutes of breakouts. But if I change my mind, you'll get a one minute more warning before the thing closes. And I want you to do two things. Just introduce yourself. We'll send this out too as a message to all of you to remind you, but take notes, two things, just introduce yourself and then to say which image or which profession, which uh, job, curator, food blogger, or um, curator, food blogger, or coach did you like the most? So pick the one that you related to the most and why, and then also introduce yourself, and then we'll come back for our final question and answer and um, final closing time. So just hang tight while we break you up into groups. And then if you've not done this before, I'm sure you probably have, um, you just click your button. And we'll see you back here in about 12 minutes. Hello, everybody. We're all coming back from our breakout rooms. There's always there's always a couple of rooms that are real chatty and they're not going to come back until they get kicked out. <laughs> so I have to wait for them, wait for everybody that gets bounced out to just come back in five seconds. So I hope you had a chance to greet one another. This is the Q&A time. So if you have a question that came out in your breakout room, or if you have something that you've been wanting to ask, please throw that in the chat. We're going to get to as many as we can. And those that we can't get to, I'll try to address on my website or some other way, I'm trying to make sure. So welcome back, everybody. I hope that you had a great time in your breakout rooms. We're going to head to some Q&A. So if you have any questions, please uh, dump them in the chat, and if we don't uh, don't have any, I'm going to talk about other stuff. But that's not that's not to tell you not to do questions. We'd love to do questions. I think that takes priority over everything else. So while you're getting your questions organized and dropping those in the chat, I did want to address uh, two things about the Lord's Prayer that we just did. One, I'm sorry you couldn't hear it, so you'll just have to go back to YouTube <laughs> and watch it. And then for number two, somebody wrote in the chat, there was a question like six weeks? Like, yes, I really mean six weeks. And I say that deliberately as an example of what I mean when I say, pare it down, repeat it, and make it more simple and accessible over time. I promise you, if you did the Lord's Prayer body prayer every week for six weeks, even 10 weeks with your congregation, you would have a greater chance that the kids and the youth and the grownups that you're teaching it to 
would remember it their whole lives in that way. And isn't that the value that you want to impart over time to your kids and your youth more than 10 different worksheets and 10 different lessons and 10 different things about in your head about the Lord's Prayer. So that's my uh, encouragement for that one. And I, I want you to take that as an example for how to approach this overall. Maybe not just with faith at home, but with your faith formation in general. Scaling it back, repeating it, and making it much more simple is definitely a trend that I would like to see a lot more of. And I've seen um, people have great, great, great success with it doesn't sell a lot, right? <laughs> That's why maybe you're getting bombarded with all these other ideas. Yeah. So uh, Jill, do we have any questions? I feel like Jill's the game show host. <laughs> it does feel that way sometimes. <laughs> thank. Well, first of all, Tracy, thank you so much. And we are getting some questions in the chat. I had two that came in that are probably similar in answer. So I wanted to um, mash a couple together here. One person asked, what are your suggestions for faith formation leaders who don't have kids? How can I help parents when I haven't had that experience? And another asked about how to minister to children and families as a single 20 something. So not dissimilar questions, but how would you approach those oh, situations? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for the questions. I think the number one thing I would say is that the best, some of the best parenting advice I've gotten has been from people that don't have kids, right? So it's, you know, when I, I should maybe say at the, at the jump or should have said at the beginning when I talked about my life and how it's intersected in that way, that does not mean that that's the only way to know about how to be effective with kids and youth. We all were kids and a lot of us remember back to that time, right? We remember what maybe we had a faith formation, a moment in our own faith formation that resonated, something that we learned. Maybe we want to approach it the opposite way. There was something that we learned as a kid about faith that we didn't, uh, didn't resonate with us. But I guess I would say, you know, to the, all of you that are that have that question, think back to your own childhood and youth, and then think back to why you want this, why you wanted this job or why you have this job. So that, that question, what do you hope that your kids, what do you hope that your kids, meaning the kids in your care, the ones that you are charged with helping, what do you want them to know about God? I think that you have your own intuition there that you can draw on. And it's definitely not uh, something that, you need to have in your own household laboratory in order to be able to do. So follow your intuition. Might You might feel like, oh, I've never done this personally, but that doesn't mean that you lack authority. It doesn't mean that you lack credibility to talk about this. Uh, it's, it's definitely um, something that you can do. So you got this. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. We have a couple of questions too in the chat about Sunday school. Uh, one person is asking for some recommendations on emphasizing faith at home so that less rides on a Sunday school program. Another is asking if you yourself have traditional Sunday school in your church, and if not, how do you make that transition? <laughs> how much time do we have? Okay, so Sunday school, this could be a whole other webinar, and I've done um, I've done a webinar on this topic through the Presbyterian Outlook. I don't know if it's available, but you could Google it and find out uh, if they have it available. Uh, so I do think that we should be moving beyond the Sunday school model for so many reasons. That's why I deliberately said coach and not teacher. Um, as for the logistics of how to do it, that is so customized. It would be so hard for me to say because it depends on your the context of your church, how willing people are to get rid of it. The one little nugget I will give about that as far as how to do it is I think it does work really well. Two things. One, have you ever heard that thing about if you want to build a new barn, build the new barn next to the old barn, don't tear the old barn down, right? So if you want to go in a different direction, I would not advise uh, necessarily for some it could work, but in most cases, I would not advise that you tear down the program unless it's really, really almost 
dead and everybody wants to. Uh, I would advise building some things alongside it, so some intergenerational events or whatever you want to do instead of Sunday school. Um, build it alongside of the old barn. And then that second concept is the idea of, um, and I don't like the kind of violent imagery of this, it comes from a book called Good to Great, where he sort of says, hey, if you wanna make a big change, instead of lobbing a cannonball at something, you should fire bullets at the target. So I use like stones and rocks sometimes, because I don't like the violence of the bullets and cannons. But if you have a target and you want to go there, don't lob the big, don't spend like, you know, six months researching how you're going to do something and then lob this big cannonball at it. Like give it a little try. Just say like, you know what, we're, we're going to try for four weeks. We're going to try and do something else during Sunday school time. And we can always, you know, do something else. If it doesn't work out, we're just going to try it for this time and see. As far as my own congregation, you know, COVID just changed everything. So before COVID, we had kind of a hybrid model where kids were in worship all together one month, one week out of the month, and then they did something different each of the Sundays. Uh, but then during COVID, we all went online and were doing different things. Plus, like I said a couple of times, it's what works for me doesn't necessarily isn't going to work necessarily for you and for your context. But a traditional Sunday school model where I am the teacher and you are the students and I teach you like I teach in school, I think that's uh, not the way the early church did it. We really took a weird detour when we started doing our faith formation that way, and I don't think it's the way to go. Yeah, detour, detour is a, a nice mild way of putting that, but I think you're right. <laughs> I am seeing uh, scads of questions. So I want to remind our folks that uh, I am in a, a joyous op position in that I get a chance to interview Tracy after our presentation today. And I will make sure to take note of each and every question that you have posed in the chat. So we have about five minutes left for Q&A. If we don't get to your question, there will be a clip that answers your question that will be available on our website sometime in the next couple of weeks. So we will make sure that that is available to you. If, you, if we don't get to it today, I'm sorry, we don't have enough time for all of these. But Tracy, let me ask you uh, one more. So uh, you mentioned having, there are some barriers for parents who are trying to implement these things at home. What does that look like? How can faith leaders be mindful of those things? And you know, even if we get to the point where parents are using these things, how do we solicit feedback from the parents on that without it being just one more thing on the parents' plate, one more arm, as you yeah. so helpfully said earlier? So I think the biggest barriers are pre-pandemic, the same ones that we have right now. So it's not like things really changed. They're just the heat and the volume got turned up on them. So parents feel like they don't have the time to do these things and maybe for different reasons now, but it's still the same. There's not time. How are we going to do this when we have soccer and lessons or daily living and, you know, depending on your context, the, the reasons that we don't have a lot of time are buried and different. So helping to show parents where the time could be and showing them that there's, it doesn't require a lot of t actual time on the clock. You know, there could be, you could use a car time, although we're not using that as much right now, we're not going a lot of places, but building onto existing habits, lots of ways to show people how to use small amounts of time repeated. Another thing that I think is a barrier is people don't feel like they have the expertise. How could I, do, you know, I wasn't raised in a faith, a home where I knew a lot of faith. I don't know what to do. What am I supposed to say or do? And to help, help them know um, that you're going to show them exactly what to do, or here's some, here's the recipe. This is exactly what you can try out at your home. And then I think I maybe mentioned this one, the idea of normalizing and laughing, bringing humor to the failures. And so I love this. If any of you know, and have worked with any of my work and you have failure stories, please send them to me because I love to use them. I love to use, you know, there's one, a practice in one of my books about using star stickers to mark the day. And a parent told me about how they tried it and then the kids had this huge meltdown about who was going to have the sticker and it was like it was the worst and so to solicit that and to laugh about it because right holy what what makes something holy you know we feel like oh holiness there has to be like ooh, all the kids have to be on the same page we're gonna have this prayer time like 
I try to do prayer time with my kids. Like, what are you grateful for? Like grateful for farts, like thanks. Or, you know, you have teens that don't want to talk to you, like how to normalize it, laugh about it and say that this is part of the job. It's, you know, part of the feeding of the baby that the baby spits out the peas at you, that you are doing your job and to try and help people realize that that is that that it is working when those things happen. It's just part of it. That's really right. helpful. Yeah, thank you. I, we probably have time for one quick, one more uh, quick. question too. It, um, one person is asking about uh, middle school and high school kids in particular, mm -hmm. and you referenced before the idea that we're starting too late with our older kids. Can you mm -hmm. speak to how you would address that with parents of middle school and high school? Youth. like the, yeah so I can I think the question is how what do you do if they feel that way and I think my first my first piece of advice is to be as pastoral as possible and say it's not too late and you know for all sorts of things with older teens I've I've dealt with this in my ministry I had a, a child that just had severe issues in so many ways and the child got to be about 16 and the parents were basically just ready to be just like it's too late. There's, you can't help. And it wasn't too late. And it required a little bit of, um, a lot of, of help and support in the community, but to be able to address, is it grief? Is that I, is it that I wished I had done these things and now my child is old and I wish that I could turn back the clock to be able to hold that and say like, you know, I understand, I hear what you're saying, but it's not too late. And you, as a parent, are an influence on your children their whole lives until they're until you're 80 years old until your children you know are while your children are adults you'll have an opportunity to do these things and so whatever it is that you want to communicate if you still want to communicate that god is loving and gracious you still can do that and so i guess it would depend on you know is it is the issue that i feel like i missed some opportunity to do some things just start with where you are now, but if you want to take a moment to, to hold that grief and the sorrow uh, to do that. So again, it's like some, that's a quick answer on a question that we could probably dive much deeper into, but uh, that's where I would start. So I'm going to go back and share my screen. We're running out of time, which is how it always is, right? Um, and I want to say thank you again to all of you for coming, and I hope that you will try and stay in touch. Come on, little sleepy presentation. I have to do this another way. It's not wanting to, it's not wanting to move on from the. So I just want to leave this up for a second. When you see it on the recording, you can push pause. This is just a little uh, collage of some of my favorite resources. There are many, but these are some of my favorites. And then I just wanted to invite everyone to stay connected in these two ways. You can visit my website. I think of my website as an old you know, an old car, it still gets me where I wanted to go, but it's not fancy. Uh, and then to sign up, if you're interested in staying connected to a weekly email, you can sign up there. I send out a weekly email every Tuesday that has links to uh, my favorite things, usually faith and family related. But like I said, sometimes things that I think make a good sermon illustration, sometimes a favorite recipe still sneaks in there from my old food days. And then, um, you can always unsubscribe anytime. So there, if you go to that, that you'll see a paid version. If that's not where you want to be, there is a free one. What I'm talking about is the free um, weekly emails with links. So I hope that you'll stay connected uh, and try and reach out. Thanks again for everything. And thank you to all of you, um, Megan, Kelly, and uh, Jill for everything. And folks, thank you so much for joining us in this time. Please do check out our website in addition to Tracy's for upcoming events and resources. And we'll look forward to welcoming you back to future webinars. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.